It is an honor to be here with you this Sabbath. Uh, before we jump in, I do want to just say, I think they get shout-outs every week, but our worship, our worship team is great. Um, just I love when people are gifted by the Spirit, and then they use those gifts for the glory of God and to bring us together. Because that's what they're really doing, right? They're bringing community by their gifts, and that's awesome. And uh, so even the ones that aren't up here uh, this week, the ones that rotate in, it's just such a blessing to be here and engage in worship with you guys, with them. Um, you know, I just, I, I love when Tyler gets on that sax. And, uh, and I don't know if you guys know this, we did have a guest musician today. He's going to hate that I brought him up, but Dorian in the back made me smile. I love that guy. So if you guys have the opportunity to get to know any of them, it's well worth your time. Uh, they are all awesome people. And so hello to everyone on the video stream. I am Josh. Uh, I will be up here walking through the word with you today. And it is going to be a great opportunity for me and uh, hopefully a blessing to you because it's God's words and not mine. So let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we pray that it would be your work done. We lift you up. We love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, one of the big things that has been going on in the world today, and I think we should all be devoted to in prayer, this is my personal perspective, not necessarily I don't speak on behalf of Rock Valley, is the fact that Roe v. Wade is potentially going to be overturned. We have a something before the Supreme Court, and they're going to be ruling on it. And so this is a big deal because for so long, such death has happened in our country because of this legalization and because of this law that has been on the books. And I'm going to, let's just, let's just be frank right now. Satan did a mighty work through those years. Right? Right? We usually don't attribute mighty works to the enemy. We just happen to know someone that does mightier works, bigger works. And so, but for so long, this has kind of overshadowed our nation. I don't think that you can legalize morality, but it does, it is nice when our laws reflect the heart of God. So that's just something we should uh, engage in prayer with individually, collectively, I think that would be a good and right thing. And in that context, in that light, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Because this is a big deal, right? This is, this is a war that, that we are waging not in the physical but in the spiritual realm. Deuteronomy chapter 20. We'll start in verse 1. It says, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and, and an army larger than yours, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, is with you. When you are about to engage in battle, the priest is to come forward and address the army. He is to say to them, listen, Israel, today you are about to engage in battle with your enemies. Do not be cowardly. Do not be afraid, alarmed, or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God, is the one who goes with you to, the, to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. This is a huge, amazing promise of God to his people in a time when they're going to need him to show up. Because the battle is too much for them in the physical, in the flesh. And so, do you think the people of Israel had ever heard that verse before? I mean, I, I would think so. And I would think it would be, probably be a mantra in some of, the, in some of these, the army circles. that Yes, the Lord goes before us. Yes, Yahweh goes before us. I'm sure it was talked about. I'm sure it was heard. I'm sure they knew it. But in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and this is going to be the main text. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we have a giant of a problem on our hands. Verse 
1 Samuel chapter 17, we'll start in verse 20. You know, we can even go back to verse 12 just to give a little more context. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite from Bethlehem of Judah named Jesse. Jesse had eight sons, and during Saul's reign was already an old man. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. And their names were Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, the next, and Shammah, the third. And David was the youngest. The three oldest had followed Saul, but David kept going back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock in Bethlehem. Every morning and evening for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and, sh- and took his stand. One day, Jesse had told his son David, take this half bushel of roasted grain along with these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. So we know that David was going back and forth. He was back and now he's going to go forth again uh, to the, the front lines to give them some food and also take these 10 portions of cheese to the field commander. Check out the well-being of your brothers and bring a confirmation from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the Valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And so David has been going back and forth in, the, in this battle. And for 40 days, Goliath has been coming forward and making his command. He said, all right, let's do this. One-on-one, you win. Which, I mean, looking at the guy, it's probably unlikely, right? Probably not, doesn't have a lot going for him. So David is walking into the situation where we have two armies, and they're yelling at each other. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was shouting out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up. We just talked about that. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. All right, so who's, let's, let's be honest for a second. Who's heard a sermon about David and Goliath before? I did not see that one coming. Who's heard maybe like 15 to 20 sermons on David and Goliath before? All right. Who's going to be disappointed if this uh, sermon about David? No, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see that. No, don't. Because what I want to look at is something different. Because when David shows up, This has been going on for a while. We have on one side a big, powerful, nasty-looking giant shouting at the people of Israel, taunting them, and not just taunting them, but challenging their God. What's concerning about this situation God, Yahweh, was fighting, was going to go fight with the people, for the people. They said, go forward. Don't be cowardly. Be brave. Yahweh is going to fight for you. And no one had stepped up to the challenge. Not one of them had claimed that promise as their own. And don't we do the same thing? Don't we sit on the sidelines for most of our lives, showing up to church on Sabbath, Sundays, Wednesday nights, Friday nights, whenever, you, whenever people are going to church, and we sit in the pews or the chairs, and we get, filled with the, we get filled with the message, we engage in a little bit of worship, and then we go on our merry way, sitting on the sidelines again. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that our propensity as humans to do that? It was my propensity, even as I was preparing for this message. Oh, there's a microphone there. Even as I was preparing for this message, I told uh, uh, some guys, I said, hey, you know what? Next week, it's it's a good day to skip church. And then he, one of the guys replies, like, oh, are you speaking? I was like, yeah, did I tell you? He's like, no, you just used that joke before. You haven't got any new material. It's funny. I don't see him here, though. So I uh, <laughs> hope you're streaming. 
But what he didn't know, and this is a little confession time, but is that it wasn't really a joke. It wasn't really a joke. Because when we look at ourselves, what we have to offer, sometimes we feel kind of empty for the task ahead of us. Sometimes, even if God has given you something, well, we take our eyes off of him for a second. And we start to falter, and we sit on the sidelines a little more. See, either we're looking at ourselves too much when we're sitting on the sidelines, or we don't know God enough. Whether looking at ourselves or we don't know God enough. Because if we knew God, if we had faith in him and what he was telling us to do, we'd be like, okay, Deuteronomy 20, you're going to fight for me. You're going to show up. You're going to do the work. He still wants us to go forward, but you're going to do it. Or maybe we just let sin hold on to us a little bit too long, a little bit too hard, and we don't give that over to God. Well, God, I, I'm a sinner. I'm not ready to do that. I'm not worthy to do that. You don't know what you're getting yourself into by bringing me into the mix. We don't believe in his ability to save us. We don't believe it, because if we believed it, then we'd be living it. And this is the problem that the entire Israelite army had. Because we know in 1 Samuel 16 that God doesn't look at men as, as we look. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. He judges the character. He knows the heart. He knows the person. So when we're looking at ourselves, we look in the flesh, but God sees through that. And so the entire army sitting on the sidelines, good job. And then David shows up, little David, maybe big David, I don't know his size. I mean, he could have been Sean Lennon for all we know. Or he could have been little Grayson. So, you know, whatever's, whatever's happening here. Grayson's my son, he's seven, in case you don't know. Um, so David shows up. And he's like, okay, David heard the words. When all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him terrified. And David's watching this. And so before this, in verse 25, an Israelite man had declared, do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. Well, I mean, tax-free would be nice. Who agrees with that one? When am I not paying taxes? But David spoke to the men who were staying with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who does he think he is? Nine foot six. No big deal. So they told him about the offer. And then this, was, this always interested me in the story. Because remember, this isn't going to be a sermon about David and Goliath. David's oldest brother, Eliab, listened as he spoke to the men. And he became angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked. Who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. Whew. Talk about life sucking. Man, Eliab had his chance, right? He's been sitting there for days listening to Goliath come and yell at him, and he hasn't done anything. And so... He sees, now at this point, you know, David's been anointed. He's, he knows, okay, king of Israel coming through. Watch out. Eliab knows that, uh, that David's been called to something. And what does he do 
with that. He demeans him. He puts him down. He tries to hold him back from the calling that God has put on his life. Now, the supposition of what if anyone else in the army had stepped forward in faith to fight Goliath, what would that have looked like? That's always interested me. We don't really have that. That would be awesome. I would love to ask God that. But God had ordained this moment, this giant, for David to step forth and establish something. And in that time, his older brother cuts him down. Why do we do the same? Why do we do the same to the people around us that are called differently than we are called? Is it jealousy? Was Eliab jealous that David was going to stand forward when he couldn't do it? That he was going to be in front of the entire army, clinging to the promises of God? Could it have been fear? Could it have been fear? Could Eliab say, I don't want to lose my brother to this. He's going to lose. I don't believe that promise. I believe that promise, but I don't believe that promise. Eliab challenged his motives. Why are you trying to do this? Are you trying to make a name for yourself? You just want to see the battle. You want the excitement. You're an adrenaline junkie, aren't you? You want people to pay attention to you. You want people to recognize you. You want your name to be great. We belittle, and Eliab belittled David's previous work. Oh, you had a few sheep. A few sheep. You think you can take this giant? And he had known David for a long time. And it's really easy for us to do the same to people we've known for a while and refuse to allow them to grow from where we first knew them. And so we put them down. We project who they used to be on the work that God has been doing on their hearts and negate that work in our own minds, in our own hearts, because we've known him for a long time. It was the same issue that Jesus had when he was doing ministry on, in the world. Isn't this that carpenter's son? Who is he? We've known him. He stubbed his toe. He was a little baby. And now he, here he is speaking truth and the mission and kingdom of God. So how many times have we gotten in the way of someone's God-ordained talent to do God's ordained work that he is calling them into? How many times have we done that? Didn't Peter try to do that with Jesus? Get behind me, Satan. Jesus had work to do. We have work to do. Other people have work to do. And if we get in their way, why are we doing that? The good news of the story, the whole story, though, in this David and Goliath story is we're not David, right? We're not the David of the story. David is a king. He's, he's a messianic archetype. So good news, you don't have to kill any giants. Jesus killed the giant. Jesus is doing the heavy lifting. But at the same time, we are called to be his disciples. And what are disciples? Christians. We're supposed to be like Christ. And so, you know what? Actually, I lied. We do have to kill the giants too. So we have to do the work because we're supposed to be like Jesus. And honestly, Goliath is not our reality. An impenetrable mountain of a man. He may look like reality, but he's not. I knew someone that had a dream one time, and it was, oh, well, no, not that kind of dream, but had a dream. In front of her was a giant mountain, unscalable, 
in her way, unable to go beyond it, go past it. It was intimidating. It was large. Couldn't be conquered. And then the perspective changed. And she was able to push it down because it was just a cardboard cutout. What looks impassable in front of us is ready for us to go forward in the power of God, in the power of Christ, who is paving the way, who has declared today from years and years ago, eons ago, and set good works before us that we may walk in them. Okay, so what's our application here? Well, let's jump over a little bit. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to jump down to 48. So when the Philistine started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, hit the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank. Boom, he cuts off the head. Awesome. That's good news, right? No more giant. Still a big old army, but no more giant. And when the Philistines, we're going to skip over a little bit, when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. And here's our part. The men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry. Can we, do we feel uh, up to giving a battle cry? Do you think, oh, yeah. ah, okay, no, no, no. I reject it. Uh, well, work on the battle cry and come back to me. <laughs> they shouted their battle cry. No, nothing still. All right, that's fine. And chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley to the gates of Ekron. Philistine bodies were strewn all along the road to Gath and Ekron. And when the Israelites returned from the pursuit of the Philistines, they plundered their camps. They're not on the sidelines anymore. They're getting encouraged to get into the battle, get into the fight, to do the work of God, to push back the enemy valiantly, bravely. And they were encouraged to do it when they saw their future king do heavy work, do the heavy lifting. But it's okay. So... There's a much different spirit now in the army, right? When they see the work of God happening in front of them. They're changed. Their mentality has changed. They're ready to go. And despite all of this, we're more modern. We're more civilized people. And so the struggles that, we have, that this army was having, well, we've obviously overcome them with our knowledge of the scriptures and our dedication to prayer meetings or fasting and just general holiness and, and all that stuff, that's all good. And we don't struggle at all with disunity and, and putting people down because we're, we're elevated. We're beyond that. Well, there was another church, the first century church, that seemed to have similar issues. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 10. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. Man, I get there, I'm like, yes, that's what I want. That's why. So I was talking to someone. I was like, what would it be like to get like to get in that same mentality, to be unified? To all agree, and this person said, well, it sounds kind of like a cult, don't you think? I was like, oh, man, it kind of does, huh? And so it's got to be beyond just, just lip service and agreeing on every single thing all the time. Because we're humans, so it's not going to be, it's not, we're not all drinking the Kool-Aid and changing there. Let's look at the next verse. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by members of Chloe's people, that there is rivalry among you. Rivalry among you. It's the same spirit that Eliab was having. There was, discord, there was 
discord, disunity, because there is rivalry. There was something in them that that were putting them against each other as opposed to walking forward together. We may have different beliefs and different opinions on some things, but we're still walking the same direction here. Or that's my hope and prayer. That's what God has called us to. We're supposed to be at least going the same general direction. But there's rival here. There's fighting. What I'm saying is this. One of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? I thank God that I baptized none of you. I think that's a really funny verse. He's like, I didn't baptize any of you, except for like the 10 of you I did baptize. But other than those, I didn't baptize you guys. I'm really glad I didn't. We see this mentality in churches, in our country, What's it like to be devoted to a man and not the calling of God? What's it like to be devoted to, to good works as opposed to the good works of God? Because there's a difference. And we can be separated because of it. One person says, ooh, this is going to be. All right. Security, I'm going to need you up front for this one. One person says, I support Former, former President Trump. And they go nuts for it. Like they are all in there like, Trump is a good man. Trump is this. Trump is the, the champion. He is the, whoa, okay, hold on a second. Do you guys know the people that are so 100% a certain person because they, they seem, that person seems to represent the ideology they want? That they start following the leader and not the principles. And then all of a sudden, we can't have a conversation anymore because Trump is a trigger point and people are either getting really mad that you like him or really mad that you don't like him. Well, it's not about the person. It's about the ideology. Let's talk about what's hurting our people, our country, the individuals. But there's rivalry because people hold on to a person as opposed to doing the work of God, as opposed to praying for reform, as opposed to talking about issues and communicating and blessing each other and praying for those that despitefully use you. Us. And in all that division, it just keeps separating and separating and separating. So much so that we're out of the fight, that we're not stepping into it. We're sidelined again. And we just sit there for a while. Maybe a year, maybe a couple years of not doing God's work, not stepping into his, his calling, his, his purpose, his meaning. And it's easy to do because when we look at it, it just doesn't make sense sometimes. When we look at it on paper... When the Israelites were looking at it on paper, standing before Goliath, they're like, man, this is not a good matchup. It's like Mike Tyson fighting Josh. Not good. Josh is not intimidating at all. That's what I've heard. I try to be intimidating. I really do. It just doesn't work sometimes. But So this, it's not going to go well. This little David guy is going to get squished. And then we're going to be in the same situation, if not worse. It doesn't make sense on paper. And God's way isn't making sense on paper either. It talks about it in in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but is the power of God to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom Foolish? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks ask for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And this is true from the unbeliever's perspective, but it's also true sometimes if we're not paying attention in our perspectives as those who are saved. And I mean this in regards to the people that God is calling to be used. Well, God, are you sure that, uh, that this David guy should be head pastor of Rock Valley Church? Are you sure that Josh is even ever going to be allowed to speak again after that comment? <laughs> I didn't come to Rock Valley for a long time, uh, even though I knew about Rock Valley. So I knew one of the worship members here a long, long time ago. And I was committed to keeping the Sabbath. And for the longest time, I thought the only, I didn't even know about UCG and Worldwide, all that stuff. I didn't know anything about that stuff. I thought the only Sabbath-keeping church was the SDA church. And so I was going to SDA churches. I'm like, ah, just, there's, this is not the right fit for our family. After two years, they didn't even know my wife's name. Of a t- two years of attendance there regularly. They didn't know her name. It's Brittany, so now none of you guys have an excuse. <sighs> then there's this other church over here. It's Rock Valley. And so I would think to myself, I would, and I would, without even ever coming, I'd be like, what gives this, these people the right to start a church? Where is their oversight? Oh, Holy Spirit. Okay. There, he, that's the one keeping, keeping track of this guy. And in our flesh, we do a lot of judging, a lot of judging, and judge other people pretty quickly. And we belittle the work that God is doing in them we sometimes even completely nullify it because we make these judgments. And if you guys think you, that you're not a judger, that's okay. I, I, I'm going to tell you I'm a judger. I usually don't judge out loud. I judge inside, but it's, it's there. But we all do this. We could say, you look nice today. Well, you're judging my appearance. Right? It, that's subjective. Like, I like that color. That that color is nice on you. Well, I, okay, sure, you're judging that. We judge all the time. We just don't frame it in the way of, like, it being a bad way. Like, oh, yeah, we're judging. In some countries, they're starting a whole social judgment system. We're like, I'll give a rating to you because you opened the door for me, and you get plus one points, and now you have a better social rating, and you can go into restaurants more likely. This is real, and this is happening. They're building a whole economy around judging other people. And we do that. We evaluate, we judge, we weigh ourselves, we weigh other people. And when we do that, we're just like those other, just like the people getting in the way of David going out to fight the Goliath. We're just like that. No, you you can't do that. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. This is extra bonus. It's not in the it's not in the notes, but it's just a bonus verse for you. All right, first John chapter three. First John chapter three. This is how we, uh, verse 19, 1 John 3, 19. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God. We do this and we sideline ourselves and we sideline other people Because we, our hearts, are condemning us from doing the work that God has called us to do. 
And God knows the work that he's calling us to do. He knows what he's put in our hearts. He knows the work that he has made. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We, we are put into this day so that we can do the good works laid before us. And if God is laying before us the good works to do, it means that we're going to be able to do it. He says, I trust Josh to do this. I trust Tyler to do this. I'm not going to keep listing people. So sorry, yeah, Tyler, you're the, you're the end cap there. I trust my children to do the work. I have ordained it. And we judge ourselves and our hearts condemn us from taking that step forward. Because we look at ourselves. We look at other people. We look at who should be doing our work. Oh, that guy is, is better looking. That guy is stronger. That guy has more money. Whatever the case may be. David was the youngest son of Jesse. It didn't make sense for him to be appointed king. Except that God looked at his heart and said, this is a man after my, this, this is a man after my own heart. You see... When God was moving, when God went forward and killed the giant, he gave confidence to his people to do the work. And we need to get amped up to do the work of God and be confident that he is going to show up when we show up. You know how easy it is to turn a boat around when there's no wind or no, no forward motion? You can play with that rudder all day long and you're just going to stand right there. But when it starts moving, God can move and direct and shape where we need to go. He can shape our hearts. He can do the work. And then when we start doing the work, guess what? We're going to be ready for the next work. We're going to be ready for the next work. When I first showed up here, I was like, man, these guys don't know me. I've been coming here for a little while now. I wanted to start, my heart was always teen ministry. Always teen ministry. And there was, for years, for over a decade, for a decade, it was, my heart was good into teen ministry, and I lost that and walked away from that. And I show up here, and I'm like, oh, teen ministry would be cool. We have teens here. And I was like, they don't, they don't know much about me. You know what? I want to serve a little bit. I want to serve a little bit. And so I became part of the security team. I just want to serve a little bit. They can, they can see my heart. I get to see their heart. And then, oh, God, maybe it's time. Let me, let, God, you know what is in my heart. You know the calling that I feel like you put on my life. If this is real, let's, let's talk about it now. And then, so a year later, however long it was, hey, David, guy that I now respect and trust and am totally comfortable coming to your church, what do you think about team ministry? And so I started small. I started walking in the good works that God has set before my path that I was able to do then. And then he's like, well, I probably need to pray about that one. It didn't take long. He's like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's move forward. And so I was able to walk in those good works that God set before me because I showed up the first time. And I built up a little bit. Okay, God, I'm, I'm doing your work. I'm comfortable in your, in your will. I'm doing this and going forward. Okay, God, what about this? I want, I want to do this now. And God's like, yeah, I called you to that. Keep going. And now I'm here talking to you guys, which is awesome, which is amazing. At least from my perspective. I'm not speaking for you guys. It's okay. Thank you. That was nice. I hope it was nice. <laughs> hey, walk this way. Okay, God. I'll show up. Because I know you'll show up. And I'm confident, not in myself, but in you. I'm confident that the work that's going to be accomplished isn't my work. It's your work. And so even as I was preparing for this message, I told you guys, I'm like, oh, like, it's a good day to skip. By the end of that time of preparation, I was able to say, God, it's your will. It's your work. It's not my work. It's not my name that's going to be sullied. It's your name. You need to show up. 
You need to do the heavy lifting. And that's where we're here. That's, I'm here. You're here. God is here. And he shows up each and every day of our lives. And we need to have the confidence in that. Because if we start acting in that confidence, things change a little bit around us. Things change a little bit. We're not so timid when someone says, I'm having a really bad day at work. Okay. Sorry about that. Or we say, well, do you mind if I pray with you? Because God has ordained good works for us to work in, and he's going to show up. He's going to show up and do the work. And it changes each aspect of our lives. The other thing is we need to have, so we have confidence, we need to have confidence in God to do the work, to show up, that his way is better than our way, in fact, because it doesn't make sense on paper. So, But we still need to have confidence in him. He's doing the work. We need to have confidence as if people get off the sidelines and get into the battle. But also, we need to have, and this is something I'm working on, contentment. Contentment to be where he has called us to be. I have seen the worst of society. I've seen pretty close to the best as well. I've seen a lot of pain. I've seen a lot of hurt. I've seen a lot of death. And it wears on you. And it's easy for me to say, I don't want to be in this position anymore. I don't want to work as uh, new people. I'm an ICU nurse. Um, I don't want to work in the ICU doing this anymore. And my wife reminded me, well, God put you there, so he's going to make you strong enough to hold that. It's going to be him bearing your burdens. Isn't it nice to have a spouse that, that knows God and loves God? Whew, she helps me out so much. Um, we're going to go to verse, 1 Corinthians 7 and 17. 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Kara, when you're there, give me a thumbs up. All right. Let each, one of, each, let each one live his life in the situation the Lord assigned when God, God called him. Whew, when I read that like a week and a half ago, I was like, oh, okay. We're going to just go. You're, just, you're going for the KO punch, huh, God? Okay, I got gotcha. you. This is what I command all the churches. Was anyone already circumcised when he was called? He should not undo his circumcision. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? He should not get circumcised. That would be miserable. Circumcision does not matter, and uncircumcision does not matter. Keeping God's commands is what matters. Let each of you remain in the situation in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't let it concern you. That seems very concerning to me, but don't let it concern you. But if you can become free, by all means, take the opportunity. For he who is called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called as a free man is Christ's slave. You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of people. Brothers and sisters, each person is to remain with God in the situation in which he was called. So we need to have confidence to walk forward in the past that God has established. But we also need to be content where we are. To do the God, God's work, it doesn't mean it's not going to change. It doesn't mean we shouldn't plan for the future. It doesn't mean that, that you're going to be in that same situation every day for the rest of your lives. You might be. Or you might just be there until you learn contentment. We need to be content where God has placed us. Because where he has placed us means that there needs to be a work done there. Oh God, but I want to go to that battle over there. No, no, I put you here. I put you in your job, with your family, in your friend circles, in your community, in your city, in your state. That state may be changing for some of us. Boo. But if that's where God has called, I'm not going to stand in that way. As much as I love all the people that, that are leaving, But that's where we're at. 
God is calling people to different things. So we need to be content where we are called. And we also need to trust and be content where other people are called. And not and be willing not to stand in God's way. And not be willing to belittle them, to demean them, or for it for good intention, be like, oh, but I love you, don't leave. You're obviously supposed to be here. Whatever the case may be. We don't want to stand in the way of God's work in our lives or the lives of other people. And when we do that, God can use us. And he can use other people. And he can make the world a better place. We live in a dark world. It needs Christians who are fully committed to the work of God to be in that world. Wherever that is. Whenever that is. So, you know what? I don't like being in the ICU sometimes. So what? God has put me there, and he's put me there to do a good work. Guess what? I've got to pray for my coworkers. I've got to pray with my, uh, with my patients' families during the toughest times of their lives. The charge nurse comes, hey, Josh, will you offer the morning prayer for us? Yes, I will, because I love God, and God has put me here to help out where I can, when I can, In his power. And because of the power of his name. We need to be confident. We need to be content. And we need to get off our backsides. Stepping into what he has called us to do. And it may not be big. It may be thankless. But if that's where God has called us to be, we need to be faithful. Because he who has called us is faithful. And he's going to use that for his glory and for his namesake. And it just happens also that all things work together for the good of those who are called and love him. Right? We love him. We are called according to his name. And so, yeah, we're going to show up in a place that it might be a little dirty. It might, might make us uncomfortable. But you're not alone walking in that path. And that's our confidence. Our confidence is Deuteronomy chapter 20. That Yahweh will go before you in battle. But be brave. Don't shrink back. Be confident in who he is. But he's going to do it. So let's uh, just take this time to worship God one more time. And then hopefully the rest of the day. And just keep worshiping. Just keep on worshiping. Never going to stop singing, right, David?